Nicola. Thank you very much, Angie. So thanks a lot. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I get to facilitate a conversation with some wonderful panelists. So let me introduce them. First, may I ask Joanna Kane Potaka to please come out. Joanna is the Director of External Relations and Strategic Marketing at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, which is one of the CGIR research centers. And it's focused on drylands, uh, the toughest environments that will take the longest to reach the SDGs. She's also the leader of the Smart Food Initiative, and I'm going to be sitting there, Joanna, so if you can... Sorry, I need to be directing on that. Do you want me to go down that. here? Um, anywhere you wish, except for there. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna's new passion is the ancient grains from many countries in Asia and Africa that she discovered since moving to India, which is millets, and it's also a traditional crop in the drylands of Indonesia. Next, may I ask Tracy Fari to please come out. Tracy works as a teaching fellow in the law school at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. She's a trustee of an, indi in, of an indigenous organization that's called the Aotearoa, Aotearoa, hope I got that almost right, <laughs> Indigenous Rights Trust. Tracy's area of advocacy and research is indigenous people's rights. Next, please welcome Ron Hartman. Ron is IFAD's country director at their sub-regional office for South East Asia and the Pacific, right here in Jakarta. Ron was raised in remote rural Australia in predominantly indigenous communities. This experience has helped him shape his passion for inclusive rural transformation and ensuring that the most disadvantaged rural people have voice in policies that affect their lives. Next. Very pleased to welcome Dr. Agus Justianto, who is currently working in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of the Republic of Indonesia. He works as a senior advisor to the Minister on Natural Resource Economics. Agus is actively involved in various fora on environment and forestry issues, including international organizations, uh, sorry, international negotiations and meetings. And he currently is serving as the secretary of the Advisory Committee on Climate Change in Indonesia. And finally, last but most certainly not least, please welcome Ms. Daechen Chering, who is Asia and Pacific Director for UN Environment. Daechen is an environmentalist. She spent all of her life studying and working on the issue of sustainability. This work has taken her from the local and the national and the global to the regional levels. So please welcome all of our panelists. And without further ado, let's get started. So Dachin, please have a seat there. Thank you. So thank you all very much and welcome. This is a great opportunity for us to have this conversation. Let's first, just to situate everybody a bit more, let's just first, if I could ask each of you to just take a minute just to situate everybody about what's your institution's take on the issues that we're going to be talking about on that connecting the dots on sustainable land use. Daechen. Good afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues. I'm with UN Environment, and we really look at keeping the environment under review. So we work with environmental and social safeguards, the policy regulatory frameworks, and also the multilateral environmental agreements, and many interventions in mitigating climate change and protecting biodiversity. Thank you. Agus. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to inform you that I'm from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. The Ministry of Environment and Forestry is a focal point for the climate change of the UNFCCC. So uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry now uh, in charge not only uh, for the environment and forestry uh, field, but also the climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Ron. Good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Ron Hartman. I'm from the International Fund for Agriculture Development. And if you're not one of the 80 million smallholder farmers that benefited from our support and services last year, we're both a UN agency and an IFI. So we make investments um, through loans and grants in developing countries, mainly to empower rural people to overcome their poverty. Tracy. Tuatahi he mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ko hui hui mai nei i tēnei rā. He mihi nui ki te whare e tū nei, ki te papa e tākoto nei tēnā kōrua. So my interest is how indigenous people's rights 
um, impact and relate to food security. And I want to particularly um, provide a, a case study of how Indigenous peoples, and in my case, particularly Māori, my community, are seeking to address that issue. Thanks. And Joanna. Okay. okay, so I'm with ICRASAT, which is one of the CGIAR centres, and we focus very much on the drier areas, which are the areas which have the toughest environments, where water <coughs> scarcity is a big issue, um, environmental degradation, poor soils, um, and, and where basically the poorest and the most mal malnourished people live. So it's the, going to be the area that's going to be hardest to reach, the SDGs. And so as, and, and one trend that we've seen in these areas is um, a movement away from the traditional foods that are, are typically often more suitable for the land use um, to the big, more commercial industrial crops. But unless we can make these, the, the foods that are more suitable environmentally, unless we can make them commercially viable, we're not going to make a difference. And so we've started this smart food initiative, which is defining food that's good for you, good for the planet, and good for the farmer. So it's combining all that and identifying smart foods and seeing if we can mainstream them back as staples. And that is how we think we can have a really large impact in these areas. Terrific. So thank you very much. Now let's get to the heart of it. We're, we're here to talk about land tenure, about land use issues. And, and it's generally recognized, but perhaps not fully agreed, let's see, that secure land tenure and community participation are important for biodiversity con conservation, for sustainable forest management. So I want to turn first to you, Agus. How can we ensure, what can we do to ensure that local communities and small-scale farmers are included in policy processes so that we're sustainably managing land and forests? Over to you. Yes. The government of Indonesia has uh, developed uh, programs uh, to support economic and food resilience of the people as well as ecosystem resilience. We have uh, several programs. For example, there is an agrarian reform policy the government has given legal right and of land to the grassroots communities and facilitates access to economic and other resources for managing the land for their welfare. Secondly, we have uh, another program. We call it the social forestry program. The government has granted uh, user right uh, to the community living in and around forest uh, to manage the forest resources for their welfare. Legal recognition uh, to the right of uh, indigenous people or masyarakat adat in Indonesia has also been progressing. The government has targeted to grant community living in around forest area access to managed forest resources up to 12.7 million hectares under social forestry program. Another program we call uh, climate village covering climate adaptation and mitigation, and strengthening community institutions could also well align with the social forestry as well as hutan adat. Thank you. So thanks very much. That's a government perspective. Tracy, could we have a perspective of indigenous people, communities? Sure. Um, I just wanted to pick up on uh, something one of the speakers shared with us yesterday about the kind of different components that need to bring about this, this change or to address this challenge. And I think the speaker was Sunny. Um, talked about individual change, change by companies, whole sector change, and policy framework. And I just want to focus on that last one, drawing in both policy and legal framework, particularly in relation to Indigenous peoples. And it was great this morning to hear of some really um, excellent examples of how people are working with Indigenous peoples to address this issue of food security. Um, but my, my research and my interest is how we can use Indigenous peoples' rights as a way of framing the relationship between Indigenous peoples, states, and, um, and the commercial industries. And I particularly want to highlight the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted by the General Assembly in 2007, which contains an array of rights that address land rights, Indigenous peoples' decision-making institutions, free prior and informed consent, so this whole array of rights that I believe is really crucially important to ensuring the processes by which the different parties are engaging with each other are based on this 
rights-based approach. So, Ron, would you like to come in on this? Yeah, um, perhaps I'll, I'll bring up uh, four points from, from our perspective and our experience of, uh, of why, why land and, uh, and particularly rights and, and empowerment are important. Um, the first thing is about land tenure itself and, um, and the incentives that that creates for people to remain in rural areas, to, to invest in their rural communities, and to develop their livelihoods. Um, as we know, there is um, pressure like never before on, on land resources. And this is compounded by the growing effects of changing climate um, and also by the demand for food. Um, so in the future, we have to grow much more food on much less area. And that prevent, pre presents a, a huge challenge, I think, for, for us globally. Um, one of the things that, that we've discovered um, through our work over the last 40 years is that, is that when particularly rural people are empowered, when rural people have access and rights to natural resources, including land, they invest in it, and they invest in it sustainably. Um, so this is, a, is an important, I think, important point to go forward in any policy frameworks or, or, or thinking. Um, a couple of comments just on women and, and youth, if I can. Um, women uh, tend to be, in rural areas, disadvantaged when it comes to access to natural resources. And therefore, any policy framework, I think, needs to, needs to take that into consideration and consider any sort of positive bias towards enabling women to, to, in, to manage their resources and enabling them to take more control over, over the policies that, that affect them. Um, in Asia and the Pacific, um, as we know, there is, a, there is a huge demographic dividend of youth. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing the, the average age of farmers across the, the Asia and the Pacific rising to 50 or above. Um, we see migration um, of young people from rural areas to urban areas. And this creates huge long-term development challenges for, for many nations. Um, we're at, at the moment in Indonesia, we're, we're designing with the government a new program which will look at uh, youth employment and youth entrepreneurship in rural areas. And one of the, the key constraints that young people tell us is, is access to land um, and having the rights and, and the incentive to, to invest. Two further quick points. Um, the first one is about the importance of, uh, of rural institutions to, to represent the, the voice of, of rural people. Um, rural people tend to be very fragmented, geographically remote, um, and therefore if organisations and institutions can help them to, to get a voice and shape the policies that affect them, uh, in our experience that's had, had huge impacts in rural areas. My final point is about the, the relationship of, of business and, and rural people, um, because this is a, a, an increasing opportunity that I would see as we go forward. Um, but it's an opportunity that um, has some caution. Um, in our experience, where we've been able to facilitate public, private, and producer and people partnerships have been the most effective, rather than business coming in and making large-scale land acquisition, et cetera. Um, so there are huge opportunities, and hopefully I'll have a chance to come back a little later on that. Indeed, if we have time, it will be important to come back to and be interesting to hear the perspectives of other panelists on the balancing the communities and business needs, how to move forward. But first, Joanna, what, what are some of your perspectives on this, please? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to talk about the approach taken to get the more sustainable land use. Um, ICRASAT, it was over 40 years ago that we first started working in watersheds, and watersheds is just the entry point to the whole land use. Uh, when we first started our very first project and first village we worked in, a lot of fantastic technologies were introduced, then our scientists returned a few years later to find that none of the technologies had continued. Um, so it wasn't the technologies that was a problem. So they set about looking at the whole approach um, and very much changed that now to a very successful approach where it's about engaging the community, the community being the leaders in this, ensuring there's 50% women engagement in every part of the decision making was, was critical as well. And, and also linking in with local government programs was just as important. The community can't do it on their own. And then the scientists seeing themselves just as the catalysts and knowledge providers, not as the leaders in this. So it was very, very important, the role the scientists play. But all of the parties had an important role. And that whole um, approach, really, we've been working at a, on a large scale now. So there's one particular project where we're working with almost five million farmers. We've been working with them for five years now and shown tremendous success. But even in the scaling up, then there had to be other approaches introduced. And, and one of the 
the approaches the scientists introduced, which was really valuable, was the extension systems are often um, not as effective and it's very hard to reach all the farmers. So they created the farmers into the extension system. So we trained 10,000 farmer facilitators. The government agreed to pay them a small amount so they're not a government worker, but they stay as a farmer and talking to other farmers and they became the extension system. And we used a lot of digital ag agriculture with that as well, with farmer to farmer videos and with um, training the farmer facilitators with the customised information on, on tablets. and um, So it was a great idea. So again, it's the farmers leading, leading the way and us really as the knowledge brokers and, and catalysts to help that happen. So I think the approach was really important. That's a fantastic example. Thank you. And you, and you give a, a good sense of how multiple stakeholders can be contributing to connecting the dots. That may not be the only thing that contributes to connecting the dots, though. And perhaps, Dachin, you might want to talk about one very important aspect of dot connecting, which is finance. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicola. And I think my panelists have already covered issues related to policy, legal frameworks, empowering communities, the policies governments put in place. But uh, if you look at, I mean, if you look at food systems and you look at agriculture, we're looking at its contribution to global greenhouse gases, over, over fishing, exploitation of fisheries, you're looking at loss of biodiversity. I mean, big numbers, 60% of loss of biodiversity is from farming, from agriculture, 50% of the deforestation is from the use for commodities, 24% of global greenhouse gases, and 20% of um, over-exploitation of aquifers, of water resources. <coughs> So this all becomes really important. And what in UN environment, what we've been working on recently is really looking at working with things like um, the uh, Tropical Landscape Finance Facility, the Seed Capital Assistance Facility for Forest and Forest Landscape. And really, um, and with Rabobank actually this month, we have a sustainable finan uh, agriculture financing facility. And what these facilities try to do is um, the, the financing facility with Rubber Bank is a billion dollars. And what it does is it tries to uh, give grants, uh, de-risk uh, instruments, provide credits to small-scale farmers, and for people working in processes for sustainable agriculture, uh, sustainable um, sort of supply chains, and also resource efficiency. Because we're finding that it's very difficult for farming communities and small communities to access finance. And there really is a gap. And we're looking at the importance of um, sustainable farming, um, ensuring that there isn't deforestation and degradation. And a really a missing gap is finance. The issue now is um, how do we take this and how do we work through supply chains? Through, um, the sustainable rice platform, and I know yesterday uh, we had Olam speak about it and the International Rice Research Institute. And again, these are things, certification programs, certification working through members, trying to get supply chains right, trying to get um, sort of producers working uh, towards sustainable agriculture. So this becomes a very important aspect of the work. Thank you. In, indeed. And, and Important aspect of the work, and perhaps it's working towards a common goal, because we're hearing about financing, we're hearing about multiple stakeholders, multi-sectoral approaches. Just as you've been listening to each other, have any examples come to your mind, or would you like to respond? So perhaps let me turn first to Agus. <coughs> you get to go first again. Any, any thoughts, any particular examples, um, any reactions that you have on listening to the panelists so far? Yes, I think uh, in the forest, uh, forestry sector, for example, we, we developed some uh, partners, partnership model uh, between the small-scale forest owners and larger-scale industries, especially in gaining uh, market access with government uh, facilitation for capacity or skill building. So uh, the government not only uh, deliver the, the policy and program, but also facilitate uh, to the small-scale uh, uh, industry of forest owners to improve their uh, capacity. So, because you, we know that uh, most of the small-scale need to improve their capacity and also access to the market. So, 
uh, this is uh, the important for the facilitation from the government. That's a really important point, that business is not just one monolithic ent entity, that small-scale farmers have very different needs from industrial concerns, but they're all part of that tapestry of, of all of the stakeholders. Would anybody else like to come in, perhaps? Um, Ron, you were indicating that you I'd, wanted to, I'd love to. Uh, follow um, up. The audience can't see, but we have a, a very large clock in front of us, which is reminding <laughs> us that we need to be very brief. Um, but I, I'd love to share with you some, uh, some, some examples from, from Ethiopia, for example, where land titling and climate smart agriculture have been producing some really good results, or from Peru or northern India, um, where acknowledgement of uh, indigenous people's rights combined with uh, biodiversity has had tremendous results, or for the Pacific Islanders in the room, um, in Tonga, um, where leveraging remittances has allowed young people to invest in, uh, in dormant land, or tax allotments, as we call, we call them there. Um, but the example that I want to give is, is from Nepal, and, um, and this started about 15 years ago, um, we, when we did some analysis on, on community forestry, which had been tremendously successful in, in Nepal. Uh, and what we found was, um, while it was successful, there were still marginalized people that weren't benefiting from, from community forestry. Um, so with government, we developed a, an approach called leasehold forestry. And fundamentally, what leasehold forestry did is, is take degraded forest um, and offer this in, to a, a group of, of marginalized people um, on a 40-year lease, and then provide them support, capacity building, uh, financial access, and everything else. And um, as, a, as an IFI, we, we wanted to assess the results of this by sort of financial and economic a analysis. Um, but what was interesting for me is the, the empowerment factor. Um, and what we found was, uh, was women not only were increasing income, um, but they were also um, decreasing the time that they spent collecting wood for, for fire, decreasing time that they spent um, collecting water or, or forage. And, and this time was invested in their children and their children's nutrition. So what we found were, were different impacts that come out of this. The important thing that, that, that I found from, from this whole experience was the, the social equity um, that was built in communities. Um, and that come through, through women having access to natural resources, which they could, they could were longer term and they could, they could guarantee. Um, and from that, it built a platform of how they were able to engage in, in policies and decision making that affected their lives. That access to assets, to facilities, to services, it's so, so very important. Um, Tracy, do you have any particular examples you'd like to share? Yes. Um, and the example I want to share um, comes from quite a different driver, and I think it reflects how Indigenous peoples view the environment. Um, so the community that I come from, very large river system, many tributaries, very bad water quality. One of the things that um, Māori wanted to do was to restore their relationship with that water body, which meant that the water quality needed to be improved. Um, the way that it was gone about was by looking at the current regional planning framework, realising it wasn't sufficient, going through a process whereby that regional planning document was changed. Um, and the result has been that there is a new um, vision not only for Indigenous peoples, but for the wider population that also lives in the region, to amend the water quality, so to decrease the nutrients, address things like phosphate, because the area has a lot of farming, it's very intensive farming. But it's a process that's going to take 80 years. <coughs> so it's an intergenerational approach, or an intergenerational solution to an issue that we have inherited, a legacy of farming practices that have been very poor and not useful to how the land is used. So in my community, understanding land is not just about the land that we get to walk on, but also the water bodies that inhabit that space as well. So it's been, um, it's just a plan adoption that's been passed this year. It's still in its very early stages. But underlying all of that, as many of the speakers have noted, is this collaboration. Collaboration between industry, between dairy farmers, between planning people, between the indigenous communities, and coming to a solution together and a vision together that everyone is prepared to champion. Um, so that's just a, an example that I wanted to use about how drivers from indigenous peoples can bring solutions to issues that are faced not just by indigenous peoples, but by the wider community. And that expertise that's brought from families from generations and carried through to next generations. Mm -hmm.
Joanna, do you have another example you'd like to share? Yeah, well, if I can bring one from a, a different part of the world this time. So an example from Africa, but it relays the same situation we're seeing worldwide. So in eastern Kenya, where we do some work, um, what, what had happened was it's, it's a dry area. It's very suitable for growing crops like millet and sorghum, which are hugely resilient, basically the last crop standing during times of drought. Uh, but what happened during difficult economic times is the government had given maize as a free food aid. So the farmers had started growing maize, and then that's what they were used to eating, that's what they got used to cooking, and a couple of generations had gone past. But these areas, uh, the, the land is not suitable for growing maize, and so basically the farmers were getting a crop only one in four years, which means three in four years there was no crop, which is pretty stunning and amazing, yet they continue to grow maize. So when we asked them why, the reason was, well, it's just easier. Uh, the value chain is so well developed. People come to the farm gate, they sell the seed. People come to the farm gate, they'll buy the grain. If they went back to the traditional foods, which were actually more nutritious but better for the environment, then the value chain isn't there. They have to take it to the market themselves. They don't even know what price they'll get or if they'll sell it. So to find the solution, you couldn't just look at land use. You had to look at the whole situation, the whole value chain. So we had to actually start to create the value chain. So we got a lot of the women groups involved in agribusiness, in developing bakery products with the, with the foods. We had to even go back and teach people how to cook it because those couple of generations had gone past. Um, and, and so now, you know, it, it's developing, it's a great success story, um, but, it, but it really means looking at the whole situation because farming, the value chain has to be there and you have to make it commercially viable and easier as well. Dejan. Yes. Um, what, one example, I mean, we saw was you needed to have visible success. So if you worked at the community level, if there was visible success, you saw your neighbor was successful. And more and more using very traditional, um, the old extension workers on the farm, but now using master farmers, but linking with the latest in science, using the technology. And I think that's changed and, you know, in real time and getting the technologies to the farmers. But in terms of investing, we're finding that when we work with the UNEP Finance Initiative, with the banking and the insurance industries, having them talk about their investments in sustainable agriculture. So really showcasing their successes. So you have banks in different parts of the world thinking, um, I can de-risk this instrument. I can work with sustainable farmers. I can bundle it. So that's, that's been uh, very, very successful. We've also found that we needed to work with governments, policies and measures. You needed to do you know, work with natural resource accounting, work with public environment expenditure, expenditure reviews. So governments really knew where they were investing. And when governments started to see the, the resources that went into disaster risk reduction, it was easier to make a case to uh, support adaptation measures, support resilience, support farming, support preparing for droughts, for early warning systems, but you had to show governments these numbers. And the work on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity also became very important, looking at the other ecosystems and how local farmers and how communities use them and the kind of investments needed. Thank you. So thanks all. Seems like we have all the solutions already. Everything is good, everything is successful, right? Okay, maybe there's a reason that we're actually having this discussion about connecting the dots. And one of the reasons, perhaps, is that eh, development is messy. And uh, part of the messiness is that different actors may have different perspectives. And even different actors, potentially, within government. So, uh, Agus, not to put you on the spot or anything, but are there any aspects of interministerial collaboration that could be strengthened, perhaps, to help us to better connect the dots? Yes. Uh, as a government, uh, government is a hub of negotiation. So we have to improve uh, all stakeholders in the process of decision making. And also, the critical one is in the implementation. So the involvement of uh, many actors, stakeholders, in the national level, sub-national level, is a must. So I think to ensure that the government policy can be implemented, so we have to involve all stakeholders. 
So, panelists, what's your experience with interministerial collaboration? Is it just up to the government to do this, or are there, uh, are there actions that other stakeholders can take? What, what advice would you give government to strengthen interministerial collaboration? Whoever wants to go first. I'm seeing Ron, you might, might, might want to take <laughs> yep. this one. Okay, very good. Um, well, firstly, government have a key role to play, as, uh, as, as we just said, um, in terms of getting um, better service delivery, delivery of public goods, et cetera, making sure that the right policies and regulatory frameworks are in place. Um, <coughs> I think, uh, I think there's, a, there's a growing recognition that, um, that government can't do it by itself. And um, as many of you heard yesterday um, with the, the Sustainable Development Goals, it's, it's probably the first time that there's been recognition that not one partner can, can do everything. Um, and that the, the public sector, the private sector, non-government, and particularly people have a role to play. Um, there's also a recognition, I think, of the, the interconnectedness of, uh, of development issues. And, and although we have a, a number of sustainable development goals, um, it's arguable that the achievement of one at the expense of another won't provide sort of long-term sustainable development for us. So for, certainly from our perspective, um, each partner has a role to play. Government is certainly um, important, um, but there are, there are others that can make a, an important co contribution. So there are the interlinkages and there are the trade-offs, and maybe we can come back to how individual actors are contributing to either to collaboration or perhaps could do more to change the way that they are doing things to help to foster collaboration. Let me actually change the order up a little bit. Dechen, what, what are your thoughts on this? I think, um, I mean, interministerial coordination is extremely important, and I think it's important because we start to look at agricultural food systems, we look at climate change. You look at climate change, you're looking at um, energy efficiency, infrastructure, floods, drought, food systems, health. So it's no longer a response that can be one ministry. It's going to be something that's going to need all ministries. And I know many countries have done this through presidential councils, through cross-sectoral coordination. But I think we in the U in the United Nations and I think other partners, we can definitely encourage and foster interministerial coordination. And in our work, we can make sure that we, um, we connect the dots. We can make sure that if we're working, working with an agricultural ministry, we make sure that the planning ministries, the finance ministries, the foreign ministries are also connected because the issues are, the issues are complex and um, they need all of us working together, pulling in the same direction. And that can be a challenge. Joanna, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, yeah, I have a strong perspective on this one. <laughs> you might have. So, and, and that's partly what's behind the Smart Food Initiative, where we're looking at food that's good for you, good for the planet, and good for the farmer. So all those three automatically, for a start, have three different government departments behind them. Good for you, you've got to engage the health department. Good for the planet, the environment, good for the farmer, the agriculture. However, we haven't been as successful, even, even if we could get all the government departments working together, which does happen in different examples, we're still not moving ahead fast enough. And what we see, we still have this big food system divide where the vast majority of attention, government policy, the R&D, the product development, even the development aid, goes into just the big three, the wheat, maize and rice. And how are we going to bring more diversity into that? How do we go from the big three to the big five or the big seven eventually? And so we've got to do it differently. And so what we did under Smart Food is we said, OK, how can we influence this differently? And let's do it in a different way. So what we've done is exactly what Ron mentioned about bringing in it. Let's make it consumer driven. And you've heard a lot of speakers up here today, uh, Rob Oliver as a chef and others saying, you know, we can drive this from a new perspective. And that's a way, if you can drive it from consumers, you can then get more attention from the policy makers. Let's see that there's some push out there, and then it, it's also easier for the, the government departments to actually get behind this as well. So we think that whole consumer side and, and making, making a buzz around things, you know, let's make this exciting. Um, and, and that's a new way that we can actually bring more attention and bring more people together. Bringing more people together in service to achieving uh, an agreed objective. That's part of connecting the dots, right? Tracy, are you satisfied with this discussion? <laughs> Do you have uh, perhaps a, a different way of looking at this? Um, I mean, I'm just drawing on my own experiences, which will be similar to many, but 
often speaking to different parts of government, you have different positions. Um, but there is a process in New Zealand um, whereby many of the tribal nations or Māori nations have regular meetings with different departments of government, whether it's on health issues, whether it's on agriculture. You could take a cynical view and say, well, the annual meetings, what do they really amount to? But it does keep that relationship somewhat alive um, and does allow a space for issues to be addressed. And it does allow, at least in a very small way for those for Māori to hold different governments to account so that they do say the same thing and the policies are being implemented. So it's a very small but practical way, I think, that at least makes sense for Māori who have chosen to put in place these annual meetings with different government departments and ministers. So coming together in fora where we can actually share the information and, and check in and hold each other to account. And I say each other, actually, let's give August another chance to come back on this. Is it all government's responsibility, or can other partners help to make collaboration easier? Yes, of course, we have to collaborate with other uh, stakeholders. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, that government as a hub of negotiation, so we, we have to involve all stakeholders. I have uh, experience, uh, especially how to implement the, the, the policy in the, in the, in the field. It's not so easy because sometimes there is a misunderstanding and also misinterpretation uh, in terms of the, the policy. So we need uh, to involve all level of government because in Indonesia we have uh, several levels. So we have to make sure that uh, the government in the field level can be uh, facilitate the stakeholders to implement the, the policy or program from the government. So let me just ask all of you a question that you might not be expecting. Do you find that the agreement on the SDGs has helped in this regard, or neutral, or, or even turned the clock back? What, what's your experience with respect to the SDGs? Let's just go down here very quickly. Dechen. I think the SDGs are extremely important because this was owned by member countries, and they put out the 17 goals. And I think unlike the Millennium Development Goals, they actually have partnerships and they have means of implementation, finance, technology, and it's a recognition that it's complex and it's a recognition that we need partners. So I think SDG is extremely important in getting us all together and they have very concrete targets. Okay, thank you. August. Yes, uh, SDGs is very important. In Indonesia, uh, the long-term and also medium-term of plan refer to the SDGs goals. So it means that we uh, commit to en and ensure all SDGs goals can be implemented through the uh, development planning. Okay, now Ron, you were talking earlier about SDGs, um, well, about goals. Sometimes trying to achieve one, <coughs> it may look like there are some trade-offs. So. What's your, what's your take? Yeah, um, my take, I, I think the, the main benefit that I see in our work is, um, is, the, is the dialogue that it promotes between different partners. Um, we've, we've discussed about government needing sort of multi-sectoral platforms, but it's, it's much broader than that. And I think for, for the first time, perhaps beyond the, the MDGs, there is a, is a focus for, for all different partners to come in. The implementation and the effectiveness and the achievement of results is still something that's, uh, that's ahead of us, but at least there's a dialogue of, of different partners from different sectors coming together to talk about development issues um, and talking particularly about sustainable development issues. And including, so just from my perspective and coming back to you on, on the business perspective, what I've, what I've seen in my own work is that business is paying attention to the SDGs in ways that they didn't, for instance, pay to the MDGs. And so that's, I'm seeing some nods here. Uh, let me just come back to you, Ron, on, on that. Yeah, I mean, in our experience here, it's been quite interesting. Um, in, in agriculture, um, generally the, the, the number of public and private partnerships is fairly limited. You tend to have public, public, private, private, but getting the public sector and private sector to realize that there can be sort of mutual value added is, uh, is, is I guess, a, a very much a process. 
And we've got experience um, in Indonesia, probably with some of the companies that are, that, are, that are out here today, of trying to broker these kind of partnerships. And, and it hasn't been easy. Um, there's been a little bit of suspicion, a little bit of mistrust, and, and a little bit of lack of recognition of, of the, the role that, that all players can play in a partnership. And for us, um, some, of the, some of the important learning is, is the, the journey and the process to, to bring different partners together to see the, the mutual advantage that can come through working together. So just the very act of having that conversation. Tracy, what's your thought on the SDGs? Um, Good, bad, ugly, beautiful? Um, it's interesting. It, it, in preparation um, for this, I looked at how indigenous peoples uh, are viewing SDGs, had quite a limited um, role of participation in the drafting of those SDGs. Um, but since then, um, some indigenous peoples have looked to marry the goals with specific rights from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So if we're really wanting to address sustainable food products, um, production systems, how does that also link into Indigenous rights around conservation and land rights? If we're wanting to look at clean water and sanitation, um, ensuring there is no hazardous storage of such things on Indigenous lands. So trying to make those connections between the goals and the rights and just kind of being mindful that those goals were not created in a vacuum, that there is a history, particularly within the UN, of human rights standards setting, and that that should also inform how those goals are implemented and realized. Great, thank you. So, Joanna, on the SDGs, and then please go straight into what is your, your take, and then we're going to come back along okay. this way. <laughs> what is your take on what's the one thing that if it got changed, we would be able to better connect those dots on all of the issues we've been talking about? Okay. So on the first question, on the SDGs, I think I'd like to take it back to talk about what I see from the corporate side. Um, it, it, it's quite an exciting place um, being based in India at the moment where it's the first and only country to ever bring in a compulsory CSR. So any company earning over a certain level of profit has to spend 2% on corporate social responsibility. And 2% is significant. And it's been really exciting. It was, came in about four years ago. And so it's been really exciting to see the change. And they have linked so closely with the SDGs. It is really, really amazing to see that. And actually, just on Saturday, I was with JSW, which is a big steel company. And you know, they've converted 55 of their engineers into CSR people where they have to take and actually work on the ground in the communities where they work and look at how they can better bring the SDGs to their communities where they have their factories. So it's very, very inspiring to see it really happening and companies very genuine. And actually, we've, and, and we do a lot of CSR work for the companies and we, it, they are so strict, stricter than IFAD and all the other donors on, on showing impact and, <laughs> and you know, making sure everything is spent properly. It's, they're, they're board visits regularly. So they're really serious, and it's exciting to see that. That's great. Tracy, that. Right. What's the one thing that's got to change? OK. There's so many things. It's not fair to say one. OK, the, the piece I I'm, find... I was actually given time. I'm, I'm moving us on. All right. Uh, the one if, we, if we've got time at the end, Tracy, what's the one thing that's okay. got to change? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, two components to it. Not to make things worse, so apply the precautionary principle, and particularly for Indigenous peoples' rights, use the international legal frameworks that exist. Okay. Ron. Um, my perspective is that the, we don't need to connect the dots. I think the dots are already connected. Um, we just mm. perhaps don't realise that yet. Um, mm. So my, the one point that I would like to project is that, uh, is that inclusive rural transformation is critical. Um, we need to make sure that development is equitable and development is for all. All right. August. Yes. I think the dot is already connected. So I think the important task is how to involve all stakeholders uh, to, to ensure their commitments, because the commitment is uh, very, very important for all stakeholders, and also the awareness and, all, and of, of course, uh, how to uh, implement the commitment. So this is a task of, for all actors in the right, development. So all involved. No pressure, but if you keep it short, we might be able to turn back to Tracy. <laughs> I think, I think one of the most important aspects is to get financial flows to a low-carbon growth development pathway and a resilient development. 
And I think uh, one aspect is really that we have to look at an ecosystem approach. We don't look at sectors, we don't look at silos, because if you start to look at an ecosystem approach, then you really start to connect uh, the different sectors. Terrific. Thank you. 15 seconds. What's the one thing that's got to change? I'd, I'd repeat, let's not do the silo effect. And, and the way we want to take that forward is looking for smart foods, so foods that feel that good for you, good for the planet, and good for the farmer. And how can we mainstream them back as staples? And that's how we can have a really big impact, because we're bringing them back as staples. And let's do it from a consumer-driven approach, too. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I really want to thank the panel for having this great conversation on a topic that can sometimes be a challenging topic to have a conversation on. But there's so many different dimensions to connecting the dots. And Ron says that the dots are already connected, but we might not realize it. So what is it that we need to open our eyes to dot connection? Thank you all for being great panelists. Thanks to Eve Foundation for organizing this. Thank you.